Hello everyone, this is Mr. O'Brien, and welcome to the Incorporation of America, i.e. the rise of big business. This really is the era in which we became modern America, modern day United States. We began to mass produce things, mass uh, consume things, and we began to be promised by the economy, by the nation, that hey, we can buy our happiness and we can buy individuality through our conspicuous consumption in the marketplace. And it was conspicuous because we wanted other people to see. We wanted other people to see us buying stuff because it becomes a sort of status symbol. All right? And this promise began, uh, or the process, the process by which we, we began to feel this way began after the Civil War. It really uh, met its zenith after World War II, um, largely because the Great Depression threw a curveball in this whole consumption thing. But the process began after the Civil War. So in the late 19th century, the U.S. experienced perhaps the fastest and most far-reaching economic revolution in history. Some of the causes. You have abundant natural resources. We had a growing labor supply and market for manufactured goods. We had new capital for investment, all fostering massive economic expansion. Many of these big names, Carnegie, Rockefeller, they got this capital through war profiteering, through the Civil War. Now, the federal government also helped spur industrial and agricultural development by enacting tariffs, protecting U.S. industry from foreign competition, also by giving land to railroads, and using the army to remove those pesky Indians from western lands, uh, the land that was wanted by farmers and mining companies. Now, every region except the south saw a rapid expansion of manufacturing, mining, and railroad construction, ending an earlier America that was based on small farms and artisan workshops. But that Jeffersonian vision was disappearing. What was happening slowly during the market revolution really, really sped up after the Civil War. So by 1913, the U.S. produced a third of the world's entire industrial output. Half of all industrial workers labored in plants or factories, with more than 250 employees. By 1890, two-thirds of Americans worked for wages, making dreams of economic independence, owning a farm or a workshop, unattainable for most Americans. Between 1870 and 1920, a new working class developed, with 11 million Americans moving from farm to city and 25 million immigrating from overseas, mostly from South and East Europe. And by the way, 1920 was the first year, at least it was the first census, that indicated, indicated that more of us lived in the city than in the country. So most new jobs were in industrial cities, whose rapid growth was best symbolized by New York. A city whose banks and stock exchange, i.e. Wall Street, financed railroads, mines, and factories, thus sponsoring industrialization and westward expansion. The Great Lakes region, kind of our breadbasket, uh, was the center of industrialization with iron, steel, machinery, chemicals, and food production in large cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago, and countless smaller cities. Before I move on and continue the presentation, I think it's time for a John Green video. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to discuss economics and how a generation of... Mr. Green, Mr. Green, is this going to be one of those boring ones with no wars or generals who had cool last words or anything? All right, me from the past. I will give you a smidge of great man history, but only a smidge. So today we're going to discuss American industrialization in the decades after the Civil War, during which time the U.S. went from having per capita about a third of Great Britain's industrial output to becoming the richest and most industrialized nation on Earth. Yeah, you might want to hold off on that Libertage stand because this happened mostly thanks to the not particularly awesome Civil War, which improved the finance system by forcing the introduction of a national currency and spurred industrialization by giving massive contracts to arms and clothing manufacturers. The Civil War also boosted the telegraph, which improved communication and gave birth to the Transcontinental Railway via the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, all of which increased efficiency and productivity. So thanks, Civil War! <laughs> Hey, 
If you want to explain America's economic growth in a nutshell, chalk it up to G, D, and L. Gerard, Depardieu, and Lohan. No, geography, demography, and law. However, while we're on the topic, when will Gerard, Depardieu, and Lindsay Lohan have a baby? Stan, can I see it? Yes! Yes! Geographically, the U.S. was a huge country with all the resources necessary for an industrial boom. Like, we had coal and iron and later oil. Initially, we had water to power our factories, later replaced by coal. And we had amber waves of grain to feed our growing population which leads to the demography. America's population grew from 40 million in 1870 to 76 million in 1900, and a third of that growth was due to immigration, which is good for economies. Many of these immigrants flooded the burgeoning cities as America shifted from being an agrarian rural nation to being an industrial urban one. Like, New York City became the center of commerce and finance, and by 1898, it had a population of 3.4 million people, and the industrial heartland was in the Great Lakes region. Chicago became the second largest city by by 1900, Cleveland became a leader in oil refining, and Pittsburgh was a center of iron and steel production. And even today, the great city of Pittsburgh still employs 53 steelers. Last but not least was the law. The Constitution and its Commerce Clause made the U.S. a single area of commerce, like a giant customs union. And as we'll see in a bit, the Supreme Court interpreted the laws in a very business-friendly way. Also, the American Constitution protects patents, which encourages invention and innovation, or at least it used to. And despite what Ayn Rand would tell you, the American government played a role in American economic growth by putting up high tariffs, especially on steel, giving massive land grants to railroads, and by putting Native Americans on reservations. Also for... So that's going to be a theme that you will see throughout US-1 and next year in US-2. The government never really was entirely hands-off. When, when some people argue the government should be hands-off, they're more talking about regulations and rules, uh, regulating the behavior of, of the market, of businesses within the market. But businesses were never shy about receiving help from the U.S. government. In fact, many of the modern-day technologies we have are through investment from the U.S. government. Investors played an important role. They invested their capital and involved Americans in their economic scandals, like the one that led to a depression in 1893. The U.S. was at the time seen by Europeans as a developing economy, and investments in America offered much higher returns than those available in Europe. And the changes we're talking about here were massive. In 1880, for the first time, a majority of the workforce worked in non-farming jobs. By 1890, two-thirds of Americans worked for wages rather than farming or owning their own businesses. And so 1890 was the first census in which more Americans worked in manufacturing than in farming. 1920, as I said earlier, was the first census in which more people lived in the city than in the country. By 1913, the United States produced one-third of the world's total industrial output. Imagine that. We made one-third of the world's stuff prior to World War II. Now bring out the Libertage stand. Awesome, and even better, we now get to talk about perennially underrated railroads. Let's go to the thought bubble. Although we tend to forget about them here in the U.S. because our passenger rail system sucks, railroads were one of the keys to America's 19th century industrial success. Railroads increased commerce and integrated the American market, which allowed national brands to emerge like ivory soap and A&P grocery stores. But railroads changed and improved our economy in less obvious ways, too. For instance, they gave us time zones, which were created by the major railroad companies to make shipping and passenger transport more standard. Also because he recognized the importance of telling time, a railroad agent named Richard Warren Sears turned a $50 investment in watches into an enormous mail-order empire, and railroads made it possible for him and his eventual partner Roebuck to ship watches and then jewelry and then pretty much everything, including unconstructed freaking houses throughout the country. Railroad we now know them as Sears and Roebuck, or simply Sears were also the first modern corporations. These companies were large, they had many employees, they spanned the country, and that meant they needed to invent organizational methods, including the middle manager, supervisors to supervise supervisors. And for the first time, the owners of a company were not always day-to-day -day managers because railroads were among the first publicly traded corporations. They needed a lot of capital to build tracks and stations, so they sold shares in the company in order to raise that money, which shares could then be bought and sold by the public. And that is how railroads created the first captains of industry like so what he's describing is what we will later in the year be, uh, come to know as a big business it's what makes a business other than the size a big business the way it's run the way it's owned and so forth and the amount of capital needed to start the business up 
Cornelius, they named a university after me, Vanderbilt, and Andrew, me too, Carnegie, Mellon, and Leland, I named a university after my son, Stanford. The railroad business was also emblematic of the partnership between the national government and industry. The Transcontinental Railroad, after all, wouldn't have existed without congressional legislation, federal land grants, and government-sponsored bond issues. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Apparently, it's time for the mystery document. The rules here are simple. I guess the author of the mystery document, and if I'm wrong, which I usually am, I get shocked. All right. The belief is common in America that the day is at hand when corporations far greater than the Erie swaying such power as have never in world's history been trusted in the hands of mere private citizens controlled by single men like Vanderbilt will ultimately succeed in directing government itself. Under the American form of society, there is now no authority capable of effective resistance. Corporations directing government, that's ridiculous. So grateful for federal ethanol subsidies. Brought to you by Delicious Diet Dr. Pepper. Mmm. I can taste all 23 of the chemicals. Anyways, Dan, I'm pretty sure that is noted muckraker Ida Tarbell. No! Henry Adams? How are there still Adamses in American history? Oh, that makes me worry we'll never escape the Clintons. Anyway, it should have been Ida Tarbell. She has a great name. She was a great opponent of capitalism, whatever. Ah! Indeed, industrial capitalists are considered